Don't worry about that. David's greatest fall in his life was when he fell into temptation with Bathsheba. Committed adultery with her. What started that process? What, what, was the, what was the thing that sealed it? It was not when he was where he didn't belong. He should not have been there. But that didn't guarantee it. It wasn't when he looked and saw her bathing. That was not it. It was when he opened his mouth and said to his servant, Go get her. The minute he put words to what he saw, he had sealed his fate. I said to the Holy Spirit some time, one time, I said, you know, if, why don't you just show up in the lives of Christians and when they say something, pop up in front of them, stop them, put them in a trance and show them right now what the fruit of what they just said is going to do in their lives. People have stopped their healings by one word. People have died because of one word. One careless word. You see, you don't mean one careless word. Jesus did. Jesus said your careless words are going to bind you. Careless word. You didn't mean to say it, but you didn't take the effort to get it straight, so you kept turning the switch on to what the devil wanted to do by the words of your mouth. The only way faith is not going to look like this in your life is if you learn how to turn it on. And so we're talking today about pace setters put action to their faith. Pace setters put action to their faith. Faith is not this thing you study about. Faith is something you do. Amen. Faith is not that you memorize things. Faith is what you do. Amen. When we get into Hebrews 11, we read some very interesting things. Let's start with verse 4. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jump down to verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Verse 8, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went. Verse 11, By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he was considered faithful. Verse 13, All these people were still living by faith when they died. My, 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 my. Good. Jump down to verse... Uh, 30, well, let's jump down to verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. Verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus. Uh, exodus. Verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. My, 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 it keeps on going. Verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land. Verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. My, my, my. Verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Look at these things. Pace setters, every one of them, who did what? Put action to their faith. Did you notice the action verbs in there? It wasn't by faith they simply sat there claiming. <clears throat> it wasn't by faith they sat there simply in their tent believing things will get better in the sweet by and by. It wasn't that by faith they just sat there passively saying, well, we'll just keep believing God and things will work out. But no, the verbs attached to what they did were action verbs. Verse 4 was by faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice. He did something. He made an offering. What kind of an offering was it? It was a faith offering. A faith offering. What's a faith offering? That's an offering that's bigger than what you think you should do. It's beyond what you think you should do. It takes faith to give. And by faith, he made that kind of an offering. In verse 7, we read that by faith, Noah built an ark. You better believe that was by faith. 
The people ridiculed him. That was not a weekend building project. Yeah. It took 70 years to build that monster. My goodness. Nobody had ever seen a flood. He's building for a flood. No one ever seen a flood. He's building a boat. What's a boat? Because he's building it up on dry land. Amen? You know, I mean, he's building by, you know, you, people laugh at you for seven days and you quit. They laughed at him for 70 years. But in the end, he built it. He was obedient. Why? For his family's sake. He did the thing for his family's sake. I'll tell you, one of these days I'm going to preach about the role of a parent. Because it's not that your faith isn't growing and, well, that's your choice. It's your children's future that you're binding up right. by your yeah. refusal to change. Right. Yeah. A parent's refusal to walk in the things of faith prevents their children from getting the inheritance. Amen. You have no right, parent, that's right. not to do the things God's telling you to do. Yeah. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your children. If you don't want to change your speaking for yourself, change your mouth for your children's sake. Amen. By faith, he did something. Why? And protected his whole family because he was obedience. obedient. And I believe that there are things that have happened to children because the parents were not obedient. He was obedient. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed and went. Now notice where he went, to a land that God was going to show. He didn't even know where he was going. He didn't even know what the next year was going to hold. All he knew was that God was moving, and he obeyed and went. You don't need a map to get there. You need obedience to get there. Amen. He put action. It was easy to say, I believe God has a beautiful land for me. We're going to find out whether you step out into it or not. A lot of people sat on this side of Jordan talking about the great fruit over there and never got it. Amen. Abraham got his. Why? Because he simply obeyed and went and did what God told him to do. Verse 17. By faith, uh, well, let's back up to verse 11. Get it in right order. By faith, Abraham was enabled to become a father. You say, Pastor, I thought you said pay centers were people who, who put their faith to work. This says that God did something. I only know of one virgin birth in the Bible. That's a virgin Mary. Amen. This says that when he was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, by faith, they were enabled to have a child. I don't need to go to Biology 101 to explain that. They were doing something. Yeah. They didn't just walk in their tent one day and say, I believe God's going to have a child. He's going to give us a child. They were working at it. By faith. That's right. They were participants in what God was going to do. Right. Bless God if God gave us a message and said we're going to have a have a son, Sarah, then we're going to go at it. Amen. We're going to do what, what our part is to do. And God's going to do His part. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Verse 17, by faith He offered Isaac as a sacrifice. That, that was something He had to do. Walking up that mountain, explaining that, that, that God's going to provide a sacrifice, but fully committed to offer Isaac. Verse 23, by, by faith, Moses' parents hid him. That was active. They did something. They took him out of the reach of the world. They took him out of the reach of the world. Someone once asked me about... Jordan being homeschooled, and they said to me, "Yeah, but you know, how's she going to get, how's she going to get prepared for the real world?" <laughs> I'm hiding her <laughs> till the day she gets released. Moses was hid in the bulrushes, but when he came up on this scene, he changed the world. Amen. Amen. I'm hiding her from the world. You better believe I'm keeping her from the world, Amen. so that when she gets ready to release, she walks from having heard from God. I want her speaking from burning bushes. Yes. Amen. Not from burning passion. Amen. Amen. Verse 29, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea. Took faith for the people of God to walk across that Red Sea. Took faith for them to walk out there with walls of water. That's right. Amen. Amen. I mean, there's Moses saying, raising his hands, that's a pretty neat trick. Hey, the walls, the, the water parted, but now you go walk between them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't some little trickle. This is mammoth walls of water stuffed up. You know that you're looking there, you're walking through. It takes faith to do it. Faith required them to act. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. You say, well, there again, see, God knocked the walls down, but they didn't fall until the people did something. That's right. 
It says right there in verse 30, after the people marched around. They had to march around. They had to walk around their circumstance. Confessing the Word of God. Not letting any doubt come out of their mind. You ever figure out why God through uh, Joshua told the people you're going to walk around the wall and keep your mouth shut? Because if they open their mouth, all they'd say is negative. My goodness, look at the size of those walls. Do you see that big guy over there? Whoa, man, I hope I don't have to attack him. I mean, see, there was no way they were going to speak anything positive. So Joseph said, I mean, Joshua said, walk around it every day and don't say a word. Don't open your mouth. <laughs> Glory to God. They kept walking around until the only thing they could think of, oh, those walls are coming down, God's going to have to do it. Those walls coming down, God's going to have to do it. Those walls, God's going to have to do it. It got seeped into them. The only word they could say was, God's going to do it. Amen. God's going to do it. Amen. And when they let out a cry of victory, the walls came down. Amen. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at in verse 33 through 34, all the things, the action verbs, they conquered kingdoms. That's not a passive Christianity. They administered justice. They gained what was promised. They shut the mouths of lions. They, they drench, uh, quenched the fury of the flames. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were powerful in battle. They routed foreign army. This is not a passive Christianity. Yes. These are people who are pushing aggressively into the kingdom of darkness and taking back that which the devil has stolen. Amen. See, I woke up one day and realized that the devil has stolen too much in my family generationally. My parents didn't have things that they should have had. My grandparents didn't have things they should have had. My great-grandparents. The devil had stolen from the Long family for years. I can remember rising up and saying, I'm going to be the generation that gets it back. I'm going to claim back territory. Some of you have poverty running three generations in your family, and you think it's just going to end just because you know these things. If you don't get aggressive about it, that poverty spirit that was in your parents and grandparents and great parents will eat up your income. What makes you think it's going to be different just because you know the Bible? You better get aggressive because you're marching in the territory the enemy has staked a claim on and he's not going to give it up without a fight. Mm -hmm. Some of you come from generations of divorce. Some of you come from generations of broken relationships. I didn't get along with my dad. My dad didn't get along with his dad. And I don't know about his dad, but I can figure it out. Well, what generation is going to stand up and draw a line and say this is a generation that's got to claim back proper relationships between fathers and sons? Because if you don't claim it back, you inherit what the previous generation did. Some of you have diseases that run generation after generation. You even fill them out on your medical things. Does heart disease run in your family? Yes, it does. Then you better get aggressive about taking back in your life and your family that territory that the devil's claim. Amen. Amen. Faith works for people who put action to their words. Right. Amen? Glory to God. Things to do. Things to grab hold of. Something that you got to say, if this is going to work, I've got to change. Amen. I can remember the day that I, I began to see things that were not right in my life because I didn't change. And I realized I knew a lot and was going nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's like sitting in your car. <laughs> you got your map out. And it says Myrtle Beach. And you took the time. You even mapped a way to go to Myrtle Beach. Over here you got a brochure of the beaches at Myrtle Beach. And you just can imagine how nice they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just great. I mean, you got, oh man, I mean, laying in the sun on Myrtle Beach is going to be great. You've even figured out how many days it's going to take to drive there. You've got some friends lined up to go with you or family and, and you're all ready to go. And you get in your car and, and, and you, you, know, you know how to run your car. You know this is the key and I can turn it on. And I know how to drive it. I took driving lessons. Praise the Lord, I know how to drive. I, I've got everything that I need. But you weren't disciplined enough to put aside the money to go to Myrtle Beach. So there you sit with your family packed up but you can't buy the gas to get to Sturbridge. Enjoy your fantasy vacation. It's not going to happen. Sometimes people say, Pastor, you're being rough. 
I, I, I'll tell you, when my businessman friend Jim told me one time, he told me, he says, you're not going to get this. Something boiled in me. How dare you say I'm not? But I, he, he was telling me something. You're not unless you change. And I'll tell you, man, I, I thank God for what Jim did in my life. Because he came smack down into my life and he pulled the covers off the fantasy. You know all these things, but you're not doing it. You're not doing the things that it's going to take to change your life and your direction. And if you don't do them, Don, I will tell you, you're not going to get there. And very interesting, the very first thing that Jim absolutely slammed me with was the words of my mouth. He says, unless you change how you talk, you can dream all you want, but you're never going to get there. You're killing your future in your day-to-day -day talking. And man, Jim used to sit down there and we'd have conversation. He'd just shake his head. You know? He'd just shake his head. I remember, man, sometimes I'd be preaching. He'd be sitting in the front row. He'd be there listening to us and he'd go. And the minute he started going like that, man, I'd turn my words around. You know? Well, I never, the minute I said I never, he just, I never used to be able to, but I'm learning very quickly to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it was absolutely was that was that a confrontation? Yeah, but you see, I was all packed up for a trip that was never going to take place. Pace setters put action to their faith; they change. Because if you don't change next year, you will be right where you are now. But if you change, things can be different. Amen. So I want to give you some things to do to put action to your faith. I don't want to leave you there. <laughs> so let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses. And we're going to find three things that you can do to begin to put action to your faith. So that you begin to talk the talk rather than just, I mean, walk the, walk the talk rather than just talking the talk. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great list of pace setters, <laughs> See, we've just read in, in chapter 11, a group of pace setters. Since we're surrounded by such a great list of pace setters, of men and women that did it, let us, here's the things you're going to do, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, of our faith. Three simple things and they're going to help you. I suggest you write these things down and meditate on them and, and as you go through your week you say, how am I doing on these three, three things? Step number one, the action required for faith to work is you've got to throw off the things that hinder. Yes. The things that hinder. Come on, there you are, you know, you're you're in a house and, and, and all of a sudden your little child's out in the in the, in the the, uh, the, by illustration only out in the yard and start screaming because something terrible is going on and, and, and as you go to get there there's toys in the way and there's a lamp in the way and how many of you are going to say well I guess I can't get there <laughs> see any moms just, you'll, you'll start throwing things off you'll, you'll, I mean, you're not, you're not going to worry about how priceless the vase is right. if it's in the way kick it out of the way to get to where you need to go you'll get very aggressive when there's urgency for what you want to do and the word throw there is not the what he talks about in other places about putting away things. There's a difference when I put away things. I pack them and put them on a shelf. When I throw them away, they're gone forever. I was having lunch with my son Randy this week and he was talking about, he said, you know, Dad, I still have the first computer you bought me. I said, you've got to be kidding me. That was a little tandy. 64 megabytes of memory. You, you can get a watch today with 64 megabytes of memory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 64 megabytes. And you know, over the years, Randy just liked that. He learned to do some basic programming on it. And he kept adding on to it. But it's still a basic 10. And he finally decided it's time to get rid of it. But you know, I mean, that was his first. I mean, he, that was his buddy. So he put it for sale on the one advertiser. <laughs> and he tried to get a couple hundred dollars for it. He said, Randy, I can get you a new one for a couple hundred dollars. He said, yeah, I found that out. You know, so then he, watch this. He tried to give it away to the Salvation Army. They wouldn't take it. <laughs> they wouldn't take it. And, and, he, and he finally had to take it out in the junk heap and watch the trash man take his perfectly working 
Tandy computer into which he invested probably over the years $1,500 of money. And watch the guy put that in the crusher and the crusher goes, oh, you know, it's no good. It's not going to do you any good. I don't care how much money you put into it. I don't care how much money you put in your education. Paul said, I count my education as dumb. I got my PhD. But it's dumb compared to knowing Christ. I don't rely on it anymore. You've got to throw things off, not just put them somewhere where you can retrieve them. Glory to God. A lot of people say, I'm going to quit smoking, so I take my cigarettes and I'll, I'll lock them in the glove compartment. No, throw them away. Yes. But pastor, that's $40 of cigarettes sitting over here. Throw them away. Yes. Well, I, I, I've come to see that, that there are certain videos I shouldn't watch, and so I'm going to, I'm going to you know, I, I'll sell them someday. Throw them away. That's right. But pastor, we're talking about $750 worth of videos. Throw them away. I remember when the Lord got all over me about my record collection. And this is pre-stuff that was today. I mean, this is 1950s and 60s rock and roll, mm -hmm. which is pretty innocent compared to stuff today. Right. But the Lord said, get rid of it. You don't need that in your life. You don't have room for that in your life. And, and, and besides, every time, you, you know, every time you hear those songs, Elvis sings, you want to go back there. So get rid of them, you know? And so I took this big record collection. I thought I'll have a yard sale. And I got them all ready. And the Lord said, why are you selling them? Why would you pass on to somebody else what I've told you is not good for you? That's right. Throw them away. That's right. I said, God, I could get several hundred dollars. Then I tried to bargain. I'll give it to mission. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it away. See, God doesn't need your money. He needs you to get emblazoned in your mind that that is so bad, it, it's hindering so much, I'm literally throwing it away I, to get into my senses that if I want this, I can't drag baggage with me. Yeah. Throw it away. Some of you got things in your closet you're saving because you can repair them someday. <laughs> I can put a patch on it. I'll shorten the skirt. I'll lengthen the hem. I'll expand the waistline. <laughs> <laughs> These ties will come back in someday. <laughs> Throw them away. Get rid of it. Because what that is, it's things that hold you to the past. And you've got to throw them away. Sometimes God says there are relationships that you've got to throw away. But, but God, I've invested many, many years in that relationship. We're friends from high school. I've got plenty of friends out here that as you read are going to help you. But your friend that you're hanging on to from high school is never going to help you. Throw it away and get a new friendship. Well, but, but I value it. We hang on, and pace centers move on quickly. They move on quickly. They just draw lines, step over the line. Whoever's coming with me is coming. I'm on to the next one. Whoever's coming with me, I'm on to the next one. And they don't turn around and look back because they got their eyes on a kingdom. Glory to God. You've got to get an attitude that says, I'm going to be aggressive. Throwing away is aggressive. Ask my children. When I get in a throwing away mood, I'm aggressive. Pull the dumpster, put it out front, open the lid, and carry things up. You know, and just, hey, haven't used it for a while, throw it in. And, and I've learned that if I put it by the side of the dumpster, I'll go get it back. <laughs> If I make a stack of clothes I'm going to get rid of and just make a stack, then what happens is when I'm finished cleaning out, I'll go back at the stack and say, I've got some room left in my closet. I'll start retrieving things out of the stack again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find that when I throw them away, just get a bag, throw them in the bag, take them to the Salvation Army, or put stuff in the dumpster. Hello? Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual principle that if you're going to move ahead, you've got to start throwing things off. Get aggressive about that. The second thing he says, throw off everything that hinders. By the way, everything. Notice what he says here. You want to run with the pace center? Everything that hinders. Go through your life and just say, does this help or hinder? I didn't say, is it sin? I, I didn't say, is this bad? I'm just saying, does it help or does it hinder? Let me give you a, a, a clear illustration. Something we put in practice this week. You know, Jordan's an avid reader. She just loves to read books. I mean, she, she devours books. 
And so over the summer while we were away on vacation, a little before that, we got her some Bobsy Twin books. How many of you remember the Bobsy Twins? You're dating yourself. Nobody wants to admit you remember the Bobsy Twins. Thank you. Two, two people will admit, three people, you heard of the Bobsy Twins. And she started reading the, and, and, you know, I mean, these books are written in the 40s. I mean, what can be wrong with the Bobsy Twins? And there isn't anything wrong with the Bobsy Twins. But she has kind of, she came through a period of about four to six weeks where that's all she read was Bobsy Twins or those kinds of books. And we began to notice a slight change in her attitude. Slight. When do you want to make corrections in life? When you're off the edge or when they're slight? And so we just, we, you know, and Donna began praying about it. And, all of a sudden, and whenever there's a change, you just say, what's going on? What, what's hindering? See, not, not what's sin. What's hindering her growth? What's, what's, what, what's the hindrance that suddenly got there? Huh, that's all she's fed on. So we, we took all the Bob's and said, that's it for now. And we ordered, a, well, my home just ordered about 50 new books that are all Christian books and things like that for her next year's school, so we got her started on those. And we realized we're going to put a limit. I mean, you can read Bobsy Twins, but maybe once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. But see, if you, if that's all you read, you begin thinking like a Bobsy Twin. Mm -hmm. But the second thing about it is this, Bobsy Twins are fantasy. That's right. They're nice people, but they're not real people. That's right. And see, when children, all they do is read things like the Bobsy Twins, then they come and read about David and Goliath, and they put them in the same category. That's it's right. a nice story, but not real. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not bad fantasy, but it's fantasy. It's not real. Those aren't real people. There were exciting things about real people. Amen. So we just made a little, what were we doing? It was something that was hindering. See, I want to get the hindrances out before they become major things we've got to deal with. Right. problem most of you are, are trying to struggle with is you've got things that were little hindrances that became strongholds in your life. Right. And now you've got to get the strongholds out. Mm -hmm. Anything that hinders. Go through your life and say, does this help or does this hinder? Is this helpful to us as a family or will this hinder us as a family? Well, we're going to go here, or we're going to go there. Will this help you as a family? Is it going to hinder you? With this discussion we're having, will it help you, or will it hinder your relationship? Well, this isn't going to help. It's going to hinder the relationship. Then throw it away. Yeah, but I have my right. Throw it away. Is it going to help or hinder? No, it's going to hinder. I, I'll, I, I'll say my piece, but you're right, Pastor. It's going to hinder the relationship. Then don't say your piece. Throw it away. Throw away. You've got to throw off anything that hinders you. And throwing it off does not mean, well, let me see, where's my nice little thing that I can hang it on very nicely and, and putting it there. Mm -hmm. Throwing it off is aggressive. Get that thing off of me. Why? It's slowing me down. Mm -hmm. It's slowing me down. You ever seen racers start throwing things off? Yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody that's been in the, in the military will say, you know, you get a, a pat. Dennis, I'm sure you had that experience being out there in, in Vietnam. You, you're loaded down, man. You're out there. you got to pay. You're carrying a lot of stuff around. If you've got to make a quick trip through the woods, through the fields, you'll be surprised how you can lighten that pack. Mm -hmm. If it's my life or the pack, get rid of the pack and keep my rifle in the road. Mm -hmm. Amen. A lot of things you don't need. You don't need those K rations. You don't need to eat. You, you have you know, K rations in there. You don't need them if they're slowing you down and an enemy's pursuing you. And you've got to get out of there. Let him have the food. I'm out of here. Let him have the food. And, and the history of warfare has always been that when an army ran behind, there was just loot all over the place. Why? People know. Get rid of it, man. This is hindering me from what? From my life. Valuable stuff, but it's a hindrance. Amen? Secondly, he says, run with perseverance. The second thing you're going to have to do is start running. You're going to have to start running. Faith is a faith. Faith is 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 an endurance race. It's not a sprint. That's right. That's right. Huh? The, the the faith race is not the 440. It's the Boston Marathon. You know, it's people. Say, oh, I see up there. If I tithe, I'm going to get blessed. Whoa, I'm going to run and get there. Oh, I tithe. It didn't work. I guess I quit. It's not a sprint. It's not a sprint. Tithing just builds up a storehouse. Yes. You know what this is? This is our Faith Christian Ministry seed box. I just put some more checks in there last night. And we're now up to, this is seed that the ministry is planted in missions. Mm -hmm. $52,741. Yeah. Wow. Hallelujah! I say it if you want. Hallelujah! <laughs> We got $52,000 in the ground. 
buildings I've been looking at lately are running around three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We need fifty thousand dollars in the ground. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's in the ground. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Say it, it, it's not a sprint. We've been planting that for several years now. I, we didn't get fifty-two thousand dollars yesterday and put it in there. We just ten percent. Every, every month, month after, from the day we started Faith Christian Ministries, every month, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. Say, well, what is it? We're not getting anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> We've gotten $52,000 somewhere, and we're a couple of months behind in what's in there in terms of the checks that have come in. Yeah. Well, glory to God. Amen? See, this is an endurance race. This is a marathon. And you've got to run it with endurance. Faith will work for those who stay in the race. We're not, we're not trying to outdo each other. It, this is not a who gets here first. Who's going to get their healing first? Who's going to get their Cadillac first? You know, who's going to win 20 souls first? This is about you taking the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step and the next step. Just don't go back. Be like the God train. Get a step and lock in. I may not be able to go further. Well, bless God, I'm not going back. Right. Refuse to go back. And, and I get enough word in me and I go somewhere and hear someone preach and the next thing I know, I take another step. Lock in, man. I've locked in. I'm like that God dream, man. I, I might not have enough steam yet to take the next step, but my, I'm locked into place. I'm not going backwards. Right. Inch by inch, many things a cinch. Yard by yard, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Throw off everything that hinders. Run with perseverance and notice what you're running. The race, do you see it in there? Yep. The race, where is it in here? Run with perseverance. The race that you decided to run. Oh, no, no, it doesn't say that, does it? No, no, no. The race marked out for us. One of the races I like to watch every, uh, every so many years is the Iditarod up in, uh, up in Alaska which is a dog sled race and they go I don't know how many days and weeks they're out there and, and they go from place to place to place and sometimes they have blinding snowstorms and they're, they're, they're things of survival you know and they get out there and they're running those sled dogs and, and racing out there and one of the years as they're going along the course is all mapped out for them but you're in the wilderness and somebody who was in the lead made a wrong turn and everybody followed the tracks so now they were running the race that Job marked out for them. Not the race that the race course leaders marked out for them. And it resulted in a mammoth rescue effort to save people. My Bible tells me that I'm to be focused on running a race God's put in front of me. See, that's why I'm not moved by what people say or think. I don't, I don't care what people think I should do. I, I don't want to be running down and all of a sudden, you know, somebody says, well, Pastor, that's not wise. If that's what God's told me to do, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm running His race, not your race. I'm not running somebody else's race. I'm running a race, but it tells me here He's marked it out for me, which means I better have my eyes open for the road signs. Amen. Never seen a race course yet that goes straight. <laughs> They all have turns. Amen? And if you miss the turn, you've lost the race. You've lost the race. Run with perseverance the race that is marked out. I, I, I remember I used to think, that, man, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. And God said one day, he says, you sure are, and you're running in circles. You're running a race, but you, you see it in a stadium, and you're doing laps. This is cross-country. And I've already got it marked out for you. You mean, Father, you've already got a plan for where I should be next year? If I'm not there, that can only be one thing. I got off the race course this year. That's right. But you're faithful to mark it? It's marked. It's marked. So when I, and you've heard Don and I say this, people come into our life, and, and immediately as, as words come into our life, they're either from God or from the devil. There are no accidental conversations. And there are no accidental people walking across my life. Mm -hmm. that's right. And when we come into situations, that's an opportunity to very quickly say, is this of God or not? Because if, if it's a road sign, I better make sure that God put the road sign there. Mm -hmm. Remember that saying he put here? 
about be careful where you stop to inquire for directions mm -hmm. along the road of life. See, some of you have let people who don't know where they are give input to your life. And you took a turn. And it was the wrong turn because it wasn't God's road sign. Pace setters are active. They throw off the things that hinder and then they start running with perseverance the race that God set in front of them. And thirdly, they fix their eyes on Jesus. Verse 2. They fix their eyes on Jesus. What does that mean? That means they have a fixation. Yes. You know what a fixation is? Fixation is something you can't get your mind off of. Mm -hmm. Amen? I mean, I remember in high school having a fixation on a girl. So most of you guys can remember things like that, and maybe girls with guys as well. I mean, I, I'll tell you, you know, when, when, when I met her, I had a fixation. I thought about her in algebra class. I thought about her in history class. I thought about, you know, hey, hey, she didn't even go to school that I went to. She was in, in ninth grade, so she went to the junior high, and I was a junior, so I was going to a different school. You know, but I'll tell you, I thought about her in every class. I, you know, I didn't go in there and say, think about her. I just thought about her. I, I didn't have to say, oh, i, I got to do my thought today. I didn't have to work at it. I didn't have to remember it. I didn't have to write a note. I, I, didn't, I didn't keep a schedule. Every morning, every night, remember to think about Betty. No, no. That was in, that was in my thought. I mean, I had a fixation. I woke up in the morning thinking about it. I went to bed at night thinking about it. When I didn't see her for days, I really not only thought but felt. That's right. Amen? I'm, I, amen? And, and, and when I left her, I thought about the next time I was going to be with her. I, I didn't leave and say, well, I've done that for this week. <laughs> we went on a date, went to the movies, did something, you know, she left her at the doorstep, turned around to walk away and immediately thought, when am I going to see her again? When am I going to see her again? I, I, I'm going to stay here all night, but I can't. So I got to wait. When am I going to? So I left just seeing her thinking, when am I going to see her again? And I, I never got filled up so full. I said, well, I don't need to see you for a week. I'm full. I had a fixation. Lasted for years. Years and years and years and years. You know, absolutely amazing. I mean, as an adult, there was, there was a part of my life that she was still walking around in there somewhere. Amen? You know I mean? Why? You have a fixation. It sticks. Right. It sticks. Amen? My Bible says fix your eyes on Jesus. That's right. That, that's, that's where you've got to come to. Mm -hmm. you, see, you got to have to come. Pay centers come to the point where they realize the only way they're going to make it is with Him. Yeah. See, I, I used to think that I was going to do it, and then I thought He and I were going to do it. And then I came to the point where He's going to do it. <laughs> I'm, not going to, I'm not going to live out this faith thing by myself. And it's really not joint ownership. Well, I have my part, and he has his part. But his part makes it work. Right. Amen? <laughs> and, and, and so I, I came to the point where I realized that, 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 when, that when I tracked my life, my success was happening whenever I was thinking about it. Get up in the morning thinking about it. Go through the day thinking about it. Didn't have to say, did I have my devotions today? <laughs> in fact, it, it wasn't a matter of whether it was devotions. Right. Great man of God that I was reading one day, someone said, what about his prayer time? He says, I don't have a prayer time. <gasps> oh, he doesn't have a prayer time. No, doesn't have a prayer time. We talk all the time. That's right. You know, That's right. a amen. You know, when, when Donna and I were on vacation for two weeks, we didn't say, okay, where's our time? It's all our time. Right. We wake up in the morning together. We eat together. We go places together. We're together. You know, how full of said, we need to schedule our time. We're, we're, we're together. You know, I don't, we don't have to have a, eight o'clock's our time. Let's have our half hour. Why? Because we're, to, we're, to, we're together. Amen. And we do everything we can to maintain that. You know, I get in the car, I head off to an office, I call her, she calls me. You know, if we don't think so, we look at the phone bill. All these calls. You know, I made a lot of calls that go between Hubbardson and Stowe, back and forth. You look at my cell phone. I, I, I leave the car. I mean, leave the house. You know, and I get about as far as Fitchburg. Turn on my cell phone. Give her a call. Hi. I just left the house. Hi, it's me. You know, it's me. I don't have to say, Donald Long. <laughs> this is Donald Wong calling. Do you remember me? I, you know, I say, it's me! And you'll know you have your eyes fixed on Jesus when all you have to do is say, Lord, it's me. Lord, Lord it's me. It's me again, Lord. Fifth time today in the last hour. I need you. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of this situation at work, Lord. And man, it, I need you. I need just, just, you know, hey Lord, it's me again. 
Well, hey, it's me. Go to bed. It's me. Just want to say good night. I'm just like, Lord, it's me. I didn't go to sleep yet. <laughs> I'm still laying here. So might as well talk to you because you got my eyes fixed on you. Yes. That's when you've got pace setter faith. When nothing can take away your focus. Work on your focus. Work on your focus. Work on your focus. And build up your endurance. And you'll finish the race. Yes. Did you get anything out of this? Oh, yes. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for the gift of teaching us. We thank you, Father, that you teach us line upon line, precept upon precept. Holy One, we thank you that you're teaching us principles that are getting into our life. And slowly but surely, like a massive ship, we are changing our course. The rudder's being turned every time we hear your word. And, and the course of our life is turning to line up with the race that you've marked out for us. Help us to focus this week that we might receive the things you have for us. May we be men and women of faith, knowing that we don't need to see it. If you've said it, we believe it. God's people say it. Amen. amen and amen. We'll turn to two or three people and say, you go run your race, I'm going to run mine.